Hello, everyone. Welcome to part four in our series on supervised sentiment analysis. This is the second screencast in the series that is focused on a data set for sentiment. And um, that data set is Dynasent. Uh, this video could be considered an optional element in the series. I'm offering it for two reasons, really. First, uh, this is a new data set that I helped produce, and I would love it if people worked on it. Uh, it would be great to see some new models, new insights. Uh, all of that would help push this project forward in interesting ways. The second reason is more practical. I think that this data set could be useful to you as you work on the assignment and the associated bake-off. You could use the data set itself for supplementary training data. You could use it to evaluate your system. And as you'll see, there are a few points of conceptual connection between this data set and the brand new dev and test sets of restaurant sentences that are part of the bake-off this year. So let's dive in. Here's a project overview. First, all the data code and models are available on GitHub at this link. Um, this data set itself consists of about 122,000 sentences. They are across two rounds, and I'm going to cover what each round means. Uh, and each of the sentences has five gold labels in addition to an inferred majority label where there is one. And I'll return to that as well. I think that's an interesting aspect to this kind of data collection. The associated paper is POTS et al. 2020, which I encourage you to read if you want to learn even more about this data set and how in particular it relates to the Sanford Sentiment Tree Bank, our other core data set. Uh, and another ingredient here, as you'll see when we get to round two, is that this is partly an effort in model in the loop adversarial data set creation. For round two, crowd workers interacted with a model attempting to fool it and thereby creating sentences that are really difficult and are gonna challenge our models in what we hope are exciting and productive ways. So here's a complete project overview. Let me walk through it quickly and then we'll dive into the details. We begin with what we've called model zero, which is a Roberta model that's fine tuned on a bunch of very large sentiment benchmark data sets. The primary utility of model zero is that we're gonna use it as a device to find challenging naturally occurring sentences out in a large corpus. Um, and then we human validate those to get actual labels for them. The result of that process is what we hope uh, is a really challenging round one data set of naturally occurring sentences that are hard for a very good sentiment model like model zero. On that basis, we then train a model one, which is similar to model zero, but now extended with that round one training data. So we hope that in bringing in that new data and combining it with the sentiment benchmarks, we get an even stronger model. That is the model that crowd workers interacted with on the Dynabench platform to try to create examples that are adversarial with respect to model one. So they ought to be really difficult. We feed those through exactly the same human validation pipeline and that gives us our second round of data. So two rounds of data that can be thought of as separate problems or merged together into a larger data set. I think we're kind of still deciding how best to conceptualize these various data assets. So let's look at round one in a little more detail. This is where we begin with model zero and try to harvest interesting naturally occurring sentences. Uh, we, so the model zero is a Roberta-based classifier and its training data are from customer reviews, which is small, the IMDB data set, which I linked to in an earlier screencast, SST3, which you saw in the previous screencast, and then these two very large external benchmarks of um, product and service reviews from Yelp and Amazon. You can see that they're very big indeed. And the performance of Model Zero on the data sets, these are our three external data sets. It's pretty good. They range from the low 70s for SST3 uh, to the high 70s for Yelp and Amazon. So this is a solid model. And I will say impressionistically, if you download Model Zero and play around with it, you will find that it is a very good sentiment model indeed. So we use model zero to harvest what we hope are challenging sentences. And for this, we use the Yelp academic data set, which is a very large collection, about 8 million reviews. And our heuristic is that we're gonna favor in our sampling process, harvesting sentences where the review was one star, so that it's very low, and model zero predicted positive for a given sentence. And conversely, where the review is five stars and model zero predicted negative. We are hoping that that at least creates a bias for sentences that are very challenging for model zero, where it's actually making a wrong prediction. We're not gonna depend on that assumption because we'll have a validation step, but we're hoping that this is uh, kind of as adversarial as we can be without actually having labels to begin with. This is a picture of the validation interface. You can see that um, there were some examples given and a little bit of training about how to use the labels. 
And then fundamentally what crowd workers did is they were prompted for a sentence and they made one of four choices, positive, negative, no sentiment, which is our notion of neutral and mixed sentiment, which is indicating a sentence that has a balance of positive and negative sentiments expressed in it. I think that's an important category to single out. We're not gonna try to model those sentences, but we certainly want crowd workers to register that kind of mixing of emotions where it appears. So here's the resulting data set. And because we got five gold labels for every sentence, there are two perspectives that you can take. The first one I've called distributional train. And this is where essentially we take each one of the examples and reproduce it five times for each of the labels that it got. So if an individual sentence got three positive labels, two negative, uh, then we would have five examples, three labeled positive and three labeled negative with the actual text of the example repeated five times. What that is doing is essentially um, simulating having a distribution over the labels. And for many classifier models, that is literally the same as training on a distribution of the labels as given by our crowd workers. I think this is an exciting way to bring in uncertainty uh, and capture the fact that there might be kind of inherent disagreement among the crowd workers that we want our model to at least grapple with. Uh, and in the paper, as we discuss, these, this gives better models than training on just the majority labels. But you can take a more traditional view. So majority label here means that at least three of the five workers chose that label. Uh, that gives you 94 or 95,000 sentences for train. And then these Devon test sets have 3,600 examples each. And presumably we would predict just the majority label for them. Uh, what's more open is how we train these systems. And in the end, what we found is that 47% of these examples are adversarial with respect to model zero. And as you'll see, the Devon test set are designed so that model zero performs a chance on them. Yeah, that's some model zero versus the human. So here's a summary of the performance. I showed you these categories before, and I'm just signaling that we have by design ensured that model zero performs a chance on round zero. We could compare that to our human baseline. For this, we kind of synthesized five annotators and did pairwise F1 scoring for them to get an estimate of human performance that is on the same scale as what we've got for model zero up here. And we put that estimate at 88% for the Devon test sets. I think that's a good conservative number. I think if you got close to it, that would be a signal that we had kind of saturated this round and would like to think about additional data set creation. I do want to signal though that I think this is a conservative estimate of how humans do. And one indicator of that is that actually 614 of the roughly 1200 people who worked on this task for validation never disagreed with the majority label, which sort of starts to suggest that there are humans who are performing perfectly at this task putting this at a pretty low bound. And here are some example sentences. These are fully randomly sampled with the only bias being that I set a length restriction so that the slide would be manageable. These are the same examples that appear in the paper where we needed to fit them all into a pretty small table. I think this is illuminating though. So it's showing all the different ways that model zero could get confused with respect to the majority response. And I would like to highlight for you that there is a real discrepancy here on the neutral category. What we find is that because model zero was trained on large external benchmarks, its notion of neutral actually mixes together things that are mixed sentiment and things that are highly uncertain about the sentiment that it's expressed for whatever reason. So you get a lot of borderline cases and a lot of cases where humans are kind of inherently having a hard time agreeing about what the fixed sentiment label would be. I think that Dynasend is doing a better job of capturing some notion of neutral in these labels over here. And we should be a little wary of treating three-star reviews and things like that as a true proxy for neutrality. Um, this is a good point to signal that the validation and test sets for the bake-off of the restaurant sentences were validated in the same way as Dynascent. So those sentences will have the same kind of neutrality that Dynascent has, which could be opposed to the sense of neutrality that you get from the Stanford Sentiment Tree Bank which was of course underlyingly kind of gathered in this setting of having a fixed five-star rating scale. So that's round one, that's all naturally occurring sentences. Let's turn to round two. So recall that we benefit from round one at this point by training a brand new model on all those external data sets plus the round one data set. And then we have workers on Dynabench interact with this model to try to fool it. And we validate the resulting sentences to get our round two data set. So model one is again a Roberta-based classifier. What we've done for our training here is more or less carry over what we did for the first round, 
except we have upsampled the SST to give it more weight. And we have dramatically upsampled the distributional labels from our round one data set, effectively trying to give it equal weight as all of these other data sets combined in the training procedure. So we're trying to get a model that as a priority does really well on our round one data set. Here's a look at the performance of this model. Um, and first I would just note that it's doing well on round one, right about 81%, uh, percent, which is well below humans, but certainly much better than the chance performance by design that we set up for model zero. I do want to signal though, that we have a kind of drop in performance for a few of these categories. You can see that especially for Yelp and Amazon where model zero was at about, for example, 80 here, model one dropped down to 73. And it's a similar picture for dev and more or less that's repeated for Amazon with a drop from about 76 to 73 and 77 to 73 similarly. So we have a trade-off in performance that I believe traces to the fact that we are performing some changes to the underlying semantics of the labels. But that's something to keep in mind and you can see that there's a tension here as we try to do well at our data set versus continuing to do well on these fixed external benchmarks. Here's the Dynabench interface. And there's one thing that I wanna note about it. This is the stock interface, but we've actually concentrated on a condition that we call the prompt condition where workers, instead of having to just write a sentence as a blank slate, you know, sit down to an empty buffer and try to fool the model. They were given an inspirational prompt, which was an attested sentence from the Yelp academic data set and invited to modify that sentence if they chose in order to achieve their goal of fool fooling the model in a particular way. And this proved to be vastly more productive. It led to more diverse and realistic sentences. I think we essentially freed the crowd workers from the creative burden of having each time to come up with a completely new sentence. And we're hoping that this procedure leads to fewer artifacts, more diversity, and more realism for this adversarial data set collection procedure. Our validation pipeline was exactly the same as round one. And here is the resulting data set. It's a little bit smaller because this kind of adversarial data set collection is hard. And you can see how good model one is. Uh, it was actually pretty hard for crowd workers to fool this model. They did so only about 19% of the time. Uh, here's the data set for distributional training. You have about 93,000 sentences. And if you go for the majority label training, you have about 19,000. And the Devon test sets are smaller. But again, the reason they're smaller is that they are designed to set model one as having chance performance on this data set. And so that's what I'll flesh out here. You can see that this model chance performance, I showed you before that it's doing pretty well on round one. And we had that kind of tension with the external benchmarks. In terms of human performance, we're at about 90 using that procedure of synthesized kind of averaged F1 values. And I would just note again that that's certainly conservative in that you know, almost half of the workers never disagreed with the majority label. So it is certainly within the capacity of individual humans to perform essentially perfectly on this data set. Uh, but 90 is nonetheless a good signpost for us as we think about hill climbing and launching subsequent rounds of Dynascent. And here are some short examples. And I, th I think they make the same point that our neutral category is more aligned with the semantics of what we mean when we identify neutral sentences and less heterogeneous than you get from naturally occurring neutral sentences derived from star rating metadata and so forth. So I'm hopeful that this is a kind of positive step toward getting true ternary sentiment, but we should be aware that this label shift has happened in these data sets. And the final thing I wanna say is just to reiterate that if people do exciting work with this data set and start to make real progress on the existing rounds, that would be our cue to launch new rounds. The Dyna in Dynascent is that we would like to have an evolving benchmark, not one that's static, but rather responsive to progress that's made in the field and the evolving needs of people who are trying to develop practical sentiment analysis systems. So do let us know uh, what kind of progress you make and what you discover.